thanks for tuning in. Uh, welcome to Arbeit's very first Facebook Live event. Uh, we got some really great information to share with everybody today on a topic I know everybody is very interested in. We hear about it all the time from our clients. It's something that's all over the news, and that is the current state of probably it's a wild, wild west of call blocking and call labeling. Um, who better to join us than Molly Weiss of Numerical? Uh, to give some insight on this and to answer any questions anyone has. So Molly, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Alex. Excited to be here. Great. So can you give everybody a little bit of background on you and uh, and your company, Numerical? Absolutely. So I am Molly Weiss, as Alex said, Director of Marketing and Communications at Numerical. Uh, Numerical is based in the Washington, D.C. area, and we provide visibility and control into the call blocking and labeling ecosystem. So what that means is that we work with the major wireless carriers and their analytics partners, as well as uh, device manufacturers and call blocking and labeling apps to give visibility to call originators to see how their numbers are being perceived across the variety of stakeholders, as well as to provide control to be able to improve the accuracy of their phone number labeling um, across this kind of changing regulatory landscape here. Um, we also provide advocacy out to call originator perspective, taking this perspective to uh, industry and trade groups, the FCC, um, and really just establishing awareness around this to kind of get the word out there of, you know, how the legal caller is being impacted by the call blocking and labeling universe and to provide guidance across a lot of different industries. We work with callers from delivering all types of calls, healthcare, retail, resort, emergency, security, safety, market research, and of course, collections. Um, and earlier this year, we partnered with Arbyte Software um, to be able to benefit their clients and getting them more prepared in this space. And we're super excited about this relationship and excited to discuss with you all today uh, robocalls and what the FCC is doing and how this impacts call originators and you know what are some best practices to just stay super proactive and successful in this space. Great, thanks so much, and I appreciate you joining us today. Um, yeah, it's, it's probably almost, I think every day now, on any news site that I'm on, I always see an article talking about robocalls. So it's become such a, a huge topic. I think everywhere. like a year or two ago is when it really started to ramp up, but um, I guess let's start from the beginning. So how did, how did we get here? How did we get to where we are? Good place to start. Um, so really, uh, this all started in reaction to an increase in illegal and fraudulent traffic taking place on the voice channel. Um, bad actors started to really abuse phone channel as a great way to take advantage of a lot of people really inexpensively. Um, so in reaction to that, government and, and industry really came together to look for solutions to be able to try to stop these illegal robocalls from reaching consumers and victimizing them. Um, so we saw around early 2017 um, solutions come out in the form of these call blocking and labeling technologies, call blocking and labeling apps designed to stop illegal robocalls from being able to get to consumers. But the issue there was really that uh, these technologies were generating some false positives. And, you know, so legal callers were being kind of caught in the net here and improperly blocked and flagged as an illegal robocall when really it was a legal wanted call that somebody had consented to receive and, and wanted to receive. So it's a big problem there. And uh, as, you know, illegal robocall traffic continued to increase, we saw an increase in legislative pressure to, you know, put um, some more legal, um, you know, measures in place to, again, try to stop these illegal calls. So we saw the TRACE Act was recently uh, passed by the Senate. A similar bill is now in the House called the Stopping Bad Robocalls Act. Um, you know, but the interesting thing here is that as mainstream media continues to pick up stories about this, you know, the dialogue is always around the, the fraudsters and the scammers and all the illegal calls and all the millions of Americans that are annoyed by the, you know, the scourge of the calls and stuff like that. And, and the perspective that's always missing is the legal call originator, you know, the, the legal businesses who are trying to call their customers and, you know, to continue communications via that form to continue a relationship. Um, you know, and the guys that are really negatively being affected by all of the, you know, focus on the legal activity. So that's what we want to talk about today. Um, and this is a perspective, too, that we recently saw pretty much overlooked, too, with, uh, with the FCC's passing of the declaratory ruling to allow default blocking of calls by the carriers. Again, the perspective of the legal caller was largely overlooked. And so I think what we want to talk about today is, you know, how is the legal, call legal caller going to be affected? And, you know, what what 
will definitely happen, what might happen, and what what don't we know, and you know, how can we just stay really proactive in this space to to work through it? Yeah, this, I, I actually, um, you know, embarrassed to admit, but I uh, sometimes don't pay my PayPal credit card bill, and uh, they'll call me all the time on my cell phone with a dialer, and it comes up as fraud likely, scam likely, like every time. So I start, I just ignored it, and um, it actually went on my credit report at one time as 90 days delinquent because of it. So it's uh, yeah, people. Don't, I guess most people don't think about that though when they're they're worried about the robocalls. So. Yeah, it's all it's misleading and it's all really subjective. You know, you just can't really trust the labels that you see. It's kind of the best guesses, but you know they're not accurate. Yeah. So what is I mean, what does all this mean for collection agencies? I mean, how is this going to affect them right now? Has it already? Is it affecting them? Yeah, so I mean, we really kind of see the declaratory ruling as kind of a passing of the baton from the FCC over to the carriers. Um, through the ruling, they stated that, you know, the carriers can now use um, reasonable analytics to try to guide their decisions on how they want to um, potentially block calls. But um, the, the ruling didn't really put a crisp definition around what types of calls we're talking about here. So in terms of defining legal versus illegal or wanted versus unwanted calls, there's not a lot of clarity. So, you know, what, we, what we're going to kind of see happen is that carriers are going to fall, you know, to use their reasonable analytics, which are the same analytics companies that they're using right now to determine how to block and label calls only, you know, probably on a wider scale. So, you know, some major differences being in the past, a uh, consumer would have to go opt in to receive call blocking and labeling. Um, whereas should the carriers decide to proceed with these more aggressive forms of call blocking, um, it'll just be there for you by default um, from your mobile provider, unless you want to opt out of it. So, um, you know, in terms of immediate impacts, there's not really a whole lot of immediate ones, but we're gonna kind of see a slow trickle as the carriers each make their own decisions about how they wanna address this and kind of work with their analytics companies to decide, you know, what should we block by default or what should not be blocked? You know, what do you define in that area of what's dangerous enough to block it and, and what do you define that is allowed to continue to get through? So it's pretty murky, but we expect that the carriers will all do something. You know, we're just not sure exactly to what extent. When when do you think um, do you have any idea of when they, do you think they'll start to do something? Well, some have actually started to um, implement free versions of uh, call blocking and labeling out to their subscribers already. So even before the FCC um, passed the declaratory ruling, we saw some you know the likes of uh, T-Mobile and Verizon and AT and T start to enable um, the, the you know free call filtering on eligible devices. So we assume this is going to continue to progress. Um, we're kind of all waiting for press releases from each of the major carriers that are that's going to define, you know, what their major strategies are. We think it'll probably happen pretty soon within the next quarter or so, but it's likely going to be a progression. You know, we're, we think that they might re release something and then continue to build on it um, as, you know, they're working with their analytics companies to continue to, you know, hopefully improve the accuracy um, as groups like us come forward, you know, identifying who the legal callers are and, you know, helping work through where all the false positives might lie. So it, it, it'll be a progressing thing that's happening now and will continue to, to unfold. So what are the, the analytics companies, they're, they're reporting to the carriers, they're saying, this is what this call is, this is what you should label it as basically. What are they looking for? Like how yeah. are they saying, this is a scam, this is fraud, this is spam. What, are they, what I guess are they looking for? Well, one of the drivers and, and where calls are going to, you know, improperly get blocked or labeled is the companies not going to get to do this behind the call. Where there's a gray area of where, hey, you getting a robocall? Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Um, so where there's a gray area around not knowing who the entity even is placing the call, you know, that's one area where them not knowing might lead them into guessing who it might be and maybe guessing wrong. So, you know, one of the ways to, to avoid being mislabeled as a scammer or fraud is to, you know, identify who you are and the numbers you're using. Um, they're also looking at a number of different factors, including um, volumes on numbers. Does it look like there's a, a suspiciously large amount of phone calls being pumped out from a single number? You know, we don't know exactly how much volume is too much. Um, they don't share with us that secret sauce of what exactly determines that, but you know, volume is a factor. Um, and it also comes down to how numbers are being perceived by 
um, the end caller. So if there's a lot of complaints out there around a certain phone number, um, consumers either complaining to the FTC about it or reporting it through whatever call blocking or labeling apps they're using. If there's a ton of reports of complaints, um, that can also factor into it. So this is something I know that's come up before. Um, clients have brought it up. They, what complaints are they looking at? So are they looking at ones that are directly, like you said, just to the FCC and ones through the apps? Or are they looking at like online reviews, like 800 notes, things like this? Um, you know, multiple sources. Some are more reliant on one or two others. You know, we know that there are multiple of the analytics sources that are definitely looking at those FTC complaints. Um, each of the also has a, an app part of with it. So consumers using that app on their phone, that's how they can report a call as soon as it's coming in, like, like report a scan or a fraud. Um, some of them are even voicemails. So where the uh, call receiver is leaving a voicemail, um, some of them take a look at those voicemails and see what's being said in the voicemail. And if whatever the, the text is, the voicemail seems fraudulent. Um, that goes into it too. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Hmm. What? Um, okay. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of an echo here. I'm going to move my speakers a little. Okay. Just to make sure it's not me. Uh, I'll turn myself down. I'll turn you down. There we go. Okay. So what um, regional caller IDs are I think a lot of clients um, use and um, do they protect against mislabels? Do they or, or protect against maybe not getting labeled? Have you seen anything with that? So we have looked at that um, in working with our clients. Um, we have a mix of clients using local caller IDs or you know, and we've seen that there's not really a correlation. Um, the the chances of being labeled as a fraud or a scam, the risk of having your numbers mislabeled is really more tied to the use of the number itself, what you're doing on that number and some of the stuff we just talked about, like how we're consuming um, how are consumers reacting to the numbers that come to the phone calls on those phone numbers and you know, what's the like, uh, much more so than the number itself comes into play. Okay. Um, so I actually, this is the, the iOS update that recently came out. One of um, someone here that I work with um, brought this up. He sent me an article on it. Um, so it was interesting that this is something that we we're talking about, but um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? The, uh, Sure. So um, we know some stuff about it. We don't know everything. Um, so based on what we know, we're talking about the iOS 13 software update for Apple phones. Um, we believe it's going to um, be compatible with iPhone 6s and up and that it's probably going to be released later in the fall or um, in Q4. Um, what is being said is that um, basically an incoming call to a device, um, if the de if the if the phone number is unknown to the device, so like if on my phone somebody's calling me and I don't already have it in my contact list, or Siri can't find it somewhere, so that means you know I haven't communicated in an email with the person, and maybe the number was listed in the email or in the email signature, or I haven't been receiving texts with that phone number in it, um, that that call is not going to ring on my phone. It's just going to go straight to into my voicemail, and the person will have an opportunity to leave a message, so the calls won't be blocked but they're just gonna be basically be silenced to go to voicemail. Um, we think it's pretty extreme. We don't, that, that's what they're saying it's gonna include now. We don't know if there's gonna be any changes to that based on you know stuff going on with the FCC or any changes they might choose to make to it before it actually being released. I mean, I think you know, as an iPhone user, I think it's kinda uh, gonna be a hurdle. I feel like I'm gonna miss a lot of calls that I want based on numbers calling me that I don't always know, you know, when I'm getting something installed in my home or talking to my healthcare providers or trying to resolve an account or it's like all those, all that stuff. I don't know what number is going to call me. So we don't know if users are actually, you know, going to, going to like it or not like it. Um, and the important thing too, is that this functionality can be turned on and off. So a user will have the ability to, to not have that on, um, through the settings. So that's also good if you don't want it, but, um, it's hard to say. Uh, what we're kind of suggesting now is, you know, prepare for the worst. If it does, if this is released exactly as it is and iPhone users are really embracing it and we see that everybody's turning it on and they love it, you know, what are some ways and some strategies that as a call originator, we might be able to um, 
improve the proactive communication of the phone numbers if possible? You know, could there be a combined email strategy to, to make sure somebody knows the, the numbers I might be calling you on or include it in a text or somehow be able to get that out in front so you, you're having the opportunity for your call to ring? It'll be interesting. Okay, on that, so on that same, I guess on that same topic, what are some things that call originators can do um, to be successful? I mean, to make sure that their call, calls are not getting mislabeled, um, what, yeah, what can they do? Sure, so um, one of the things we're really stressing right now is just stay proactive and stay aware of what's going on. So, you know, today, this this conversation, I think is really helpful, just letting users know what is out there, what's true, what's not true, because there's a lot of stuff on the internet about robocall blocking and labeling. Some of it is accurate and some of it is totally false. So just having an understanding of, you know, what's myth busting almost, what you can do and you know what's just not gonna happen. Um, we say that's kind of one element to take into consideration here. The other, um, you know, as part of that staying proactive, let's circle back to the FCC uh, declaratory ruling a little bit. Within the ruling, um, they're saying that Carriers can use reasonable analytics to decide what could be blocked. They're also stating that there should be a redress mechanism to allow callers who might be improperly blocked to basically put, put in a complaint about that to get their numbers unblocked. So that again, making um, you know awareness around that is really important and that's something that we're doing now. The, the same path that Numerical provides out to our customers and clients of Arbytes to be able to proactively identify yourself as being a trusted caller. And these are the phone numbers I'm using. Please don't label them as a fraud or scam. Don't block them. I mean, we see that that's going to be a pathway that continues to be out there to where, you know, understanding what to do if you do get blocked um, as it continues to unfold. I think, you know, right now we expect that carriers will continue to use their analytics partners and providers like us who are, you know, providing the data out to the partners will continue to be a valuable path to have. But um, just you know, making making companies aware that this is something they're going to need to think about. Um, and then the third one kind of comes back to what we were just talking about with Siri and the iPhone iOS update. You know, um, as the phone channel continues to be pretty volatile and changing, um, it's a great idea to think about areas where maybe implementing an omni-channel communication strategy could be super beneficial. Um, and even you know, with just some of the changes coming out of the CFPB allowing specifically collections industries, more freedom in the ways that they're communicating with consumers. Thinking about what the, an omni-channel strategy might look like, is now is a great time to start doing that. Yeah, I agree, that's a, that's a good idea. What, um, is there any best practices that you have, or um, I don't know if this is something that has even been brought up or has been thought about, but for what the actual collectors are saying when they get when they speak to somebody, um, to make sure that people after they hang up the call aren't marking that call as spam. I mean, I'm sure you know collectors are calling all day; they're going to get wrong numbers. Is there? Have, have you spoke to anybody about this? Has this been something that's come up, or does it even have an effect? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, data integrity there is pretty big. Making sure you're calling the right folks is going to be huge um, as a way to avoid some of those improper scam labels because you're, you're asking, calling and asking for the wrong person. So right. that is a really good strategy to have. We also kind of look at number usage and there's not one, you know, rule of thumb here. It's a little bit of a, a, a cocktail of the best mix that works for you. But, you know, we have seen some success back talking about, you know, usage of local caller numbers versus toll free numbers, um, you know, trying to not make a whole bunch of different types of calls on maybe one phone number, not putting all your eggs in one basket and having, you know, 100% of your traffic all going through one phone number. Um, you know, sometimes that can negatively affect the way you're rated. If sometimes you're talking about customer service on that phone number, and sometimes you're calling about an accounts pass too, or sometimes you're calling about sales, that can seem like you don't know who you are, what you're doing, and it can break some red flags when analytics are tracking when this consumer that was in the market as well. Somebody else says it was customer service and somebody else says it was um, a debt collector. So kind of um, knowing who you are and using phone numbers appropriately and kind of trying to, to almost like silo your use of phone numbers has been successful. I mean, again, it's not a hard and fast rule, but we've seen clients that have had success when they're kind of cleaning up the way to use numbers and you know, um, identifying sort of more delineation between you know flopping around a lot with what you're doing in the call. Okay, so we have a, it looks like we have a question here from Elliot. Um, they want to know if uh, you can give your opinion on stir shaken and 
um, when it might be implemented uh, to agree that it would actually have a positive impact? Sure. So um, stir shaken. Yeah, we we believe that that's going to be implemented probably in 2020, maybe at the end of this year. Um, again, as a kind of a, a slow trickle where uh, the, some of the major carriers and service providers are, are doing tests now to see if they can pass an authenticated call from you know one provider to another provider. Because really what this protocol is doing is trying to um, identify basically traceability back to the origination of a call um, to you know basically where it came from. So if it was indeed fraudulent, we could figure that out. Um, and uh, the goal here will be to remove a lot of the illegally spoofed traffic where um, individuals are placing calls from numbers that don't even really exist uh, or spoofing, kind of masking their real identity through somebody else's phone number. So it's really a methodology to try to hone in on that, identify those illegally spoofed calls and, and stop that traffic. Because that, that's really a major source of robocall scams are is coming through illegally spoofed traffic. Um, but what Stir Shaken is not going to do is, is really identify the trust in the caller themselves, it's really going to just identify the fact that the call originated from a real number on a real network. So it's kind of phase one here. I mean, we do think that's going to be successful in being able to identify these illegally spoofed calls and cut down on some of that traffic, which will be great. And it should cut down on a lot of, you know, numbers you get into your phone and it's like, it's not even a real area code, you know, you can't call it back. So we should see those going away, but there's still more work to be done after that in, in verifying, you know, hey, this is a call coming from a real person, real number. And B, I can actually trust that person who's calling me as well. So there's going to be another layer on top of this, which you know is some of the some of the things that we're kind of you know getting into here with our certification process and identifying you know trust around who's calling you. So it'll be effective, but it's not. It's definitely not the silver bullet to to stop all robocalls. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's it. I think we have. Uh, we don't have any other questions. Um, yeah, do you have anything else you want to go over? Are you good? Well, um, last thing is that speaking of Stir Shaken, um, this Thursday, anybody who wants to tune into that live stream of the FCC uh, robocall uh, Stir Shaken Summit, that's going to be on Thursday, live streaming off the FCC website. So for those interested in that topic, that would be a good thing to tune into. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much. Um, anyone watching or seeing this uh, recording, if you want more information on the numerical and Arbite partnership, so comment below and we'll DM you um, a link to the article that talks about it a little bit more and the benefits that it'll have for your company. Um, but other than that, that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Molly, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I appreciate all the information. I hope everybody. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much.